Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for January 23rd, 2016. First off, this one was sent by my friend Dan N. And I'm going to give you several links to this. This is WearPro 3D Stereo Mic. And this is about binaural recording. Some of you, if you're old enough, may remember in the mid-70s, there were two things that came about as being uh, new ideas. I don't know how new they are because some of them go back further. But in the mid-70s, I remember uh, the quadraphonic recordings. You'd either get matrix or discrete where you'd have four speakers, which is similar to what we use now for surround sound. In fact, now we use five to seven channels to do that. But this was binaural sound. and We used to call them dummy head recordings because they would have this advertisement with a styrofoam head. I'll put a picture up here of uh, kind of what it looked like. I couldn't find the exact same thing that I remember from the 70s, but this is pretty close and it'd be a, a dummy type of styrofoam head with two microphone elements in each ear and it would supposedly give you the same effect. Now I've never heard it myself, but people that have heard it say it does work pretty good provided you use headphones with it. That's what this binaural recording was all about. That It pretty much, because it uses a head type of shape, you get that same effect from uh, actually listening to a, a stereo headphone set as you would if you were listening to it live because of the, the shape of the ear, the acoustics, the time delay, everything that has to do with the way we listen. Um, however, in one of the articles here, it actually says that, uh, uh, let's see which the article, this is from uh, Roland US, um, they actually say it sounds pretty good when you listen to it with um, regular speakers, but most of the people that I have read in the articles I've read about binaural recording say it's not really that great. You pretty much have to have headphones to get that kind of effect but I'll put up some links to some different recordings and stuff like that there have been some artists that have used it it seems to be really effective studio recordings don't work quite so well because I mean it's an artificial environment but if you're looking to recreate um, acoustic hall types of settings and stuff like that like an opera or a, um, a orca orchestra setting something like that where you'd actually want to get all the room acoustics and the place where it took place it, kind of reproduces that supposedly fairly accurately. Now I'd also like to know from you guys if any of you have actually experienced um, especially listening to binaural recordings or if you've experienced um, producing them yourself. I guess there's a resurgence of it again now and people are actually producing them and this WearPro mic which works with GoPros supposedly it's around $100. Now although you stick them in your ears like earbuds there's no earbud function to them so you're not going to really hear anything it's just to use them as the microphone pickup and then I guess you can also uh, by taking them out of your ears and sticking them close together um, with some kind of magnet or something like that you can just use it as a, a dual pickup microphone kind of like the dual pickup Sony mic where you just have the right and the left channels pointing off in different directions but yeah, it's it's pretty interesting to learn about that uh, binaural recording. And they've also got pseudo binaural recording where you just take two microphones and point them at opposite sides about seven inches apart, similar to your um, distance of your eardrums apart, but not getting any of the effect from your uh, shape of your ear or the fact that your head blocks the sound or anything like that. So they call those pseudo binaural recordings. And they say those sound quite a bit better on speakers. But if you do want to check it out, and uh, it's not compatible with the older like the Hero 2 cameras but the Hero 3 and beyond the ones that have the USB plug that's what these uh, actual these uh, the set of microphones is is compatible with so um, if you want to bring high quality stereo and binaural sound to your GoPro videos as it said for 100 bucks it might be worth a shot I'd say and next this is from my friend Dave and scientists Good evidence for ninth planet in solar system. Now, uh, these scientists are not slackers about this. Uh, maybe you've already heard it too. I've uh, seen people posting about it on Facebook, but they think there's a Neptune-sized planet, or pretty close to a Neptune-sized planet, out in the Kyber Belt. So, um, the gas. I'll just read a little bit of it. The gas giant is thought to be almost as big as Neptune and orbiting billions of miles beyond Neptune's path, distant enough to take 10,000 to 20,000 years to circle the sun. They're thinking it could be possible that even a, a really good quality amateur backyard telescope could possibly pick it up if it's got a bright enough uh, reflective index, but if not, it may need an outer space type of telescope to be able to pick it up. And some people are saying, well, how about we get that telescope way out near Pluto? Unfortunately, it's exactly the opposite side of where they think this planet is predicted to be. Um, once it's detected, Brown and Sister will be no Pluto-style planetary debate. Brown ought to know he's the so-called Pluto killer. 
who helped lead the charge against Pluto's planetary status in 2006. Which, by the way, if you live in Illinois, Pluto still is a full planet. It's the law. Yeah, we did pass that law because Clyde Tombaugh that discovered Pluto happens to have uh, been born in Illinois. So, yeah, we uh, we even made a law to make that. So, um, the two shaped their prediction on the fact that six objects in icy Kyber Belt or Twilight Zone on the far reaches of the solar system appear to be influenced by only one thing, a real planet. Now, orbits are so predictable and so precise that if anything even affects them, you should be able to tell right away. I mean, that's how accurate we've got orbitals down. So if you have some known effects of what's perturbing the orbit, that's one thing. But if something somehow the orbit is not exactly where it's predicted to be or it's a little bit out of what the predicted orbit should be, the place it should be, then you know that something you don't know about has actually perturbed that orbit. Uh, that uh, th this is a prediction we have found is a gravitational signature of Planet Nine lurking in the outskirts of the solar system. We have not found the object itself. Be stressed, but added the actual discovery when it happens will be era defining. So something about the Kuiper Belt objects they've been tracking, they're not ex exactly precisely where they should be, except the fact that something with gravity pull is actually changing the orbit somehow. So they seem pretty confident about it, and that would be kind of cool if the uh, backyard astronomers or something like that discovered it first. I'm kind of thinking like a lot of things, if we actually examine enough plates taken out of the night sky, I mean a lot of these telescopes do surveys of the night sky, we could actually maybe go back and something that was taken out, not necessarily a plate per se, I call them plates because they used to be glass plates, but let's just say uh, photographs of sections of the night sky taken with very powerful telescopes. Um, it might be that we've actually seen it before, but you know, it's just been a, a spot of light or something like that on a picture. Um, so a lot of people would just assume it was a star rather than a planet. But it's very possible by looking through old photographs and possibly even glass plates that we could come up with that ninth planet. Or in the case of Illinois, I guess you'd have to legally call it the tenth planet. And this next one is from 1954, Shadow, my friend Bob, the man who turned night into day. This is a really long read if you're really geeky and you want a real long read. This is a uh, Soviet scientist. His name is Vladimir Siromayatinikov. No, Siromayatinikov. And I probably slaughtered it really bad. But he actually did get a space mirror out in outer space that projected some light back towards Earth. Unfortunately, when he did it, it was on a day that was really cloudy, so they didn't get really much of the effect before they ended up deorbiting it and destroying it. But as far as a concept of uh, taking a, a space mirror and maybe lighting up a small city or sm lighting up some farm fields or something like that, I had no idea that this actually was functional at one time and quite a ways back when, he, when this happened. So if you feel like some... Uh, some uh, large amount of reading. I mean, it's it's pages and pages and pages of reading, but it's got some interesting. Uh, uh, it's got an interesting picture with it and some things like that to kind of show you what you know an artist's uh, idea of what it would look like. And uh, yeah, if you're up to the reading, it's something that uh, it was new to me. I mean, I know they had the ideas of it, but I didn't think they'd actually even had it worked even for this uh, small limited amount of time. But he just couldn't get funding. He wanted to go for uh, the next bigger thing with a, a larger mirror. That was, uh, you know, quite a bit larger diameter to light up more area, but they just didn't come up with the funding for, for some reason or other. But yeah, uh, interesting read if you want to read some geeky material and a long material too, from motherboard.vice.com. And last up, I would like to give a shout out to my friend Muzzle Mike again in the ITL that he does the in the lawn, uh, in the lounge, or in the large garage, depending on weather conditions, to different places. Weekly variety show, and he's been at it now for quite a long time. I don't know if it's been over a year now or not. I'm not sure, but he's uh, kept pretty much on track with uh, very few breaks in between. But I always like to support somebody else that does a weekly show. It's a lot harder than you imagine to keep coming up with good material week after week and do a weekly show on YouTube. I'm on, I'm in my tenth season right now, and uh, I tell you, it's uh it's enjoyable 99% of the time. I will have to say I do enjoy it, and I like the contributions. In fact, this whole show put on today is just basically based on uh, contributions from the people that watch this show, and I appreciate it very much. But if you want to crank out a weekly show once in a while, you might not just feel like it, but the people expect it. So you know what? It's good to learn some discipline and just get up and do it and just crank out a show and still. Uh, and the funny thing about it is sometimes when I've had the hardest times with the show, people have said that's one of their more enjoyable show shows. And then sometimes when it's been easy to do, I don't really get that much response. But I seem to have at least around a hundred dedicated viewers that stick with it week after week. And uh, thank you very much. I couldn't. I 
really wouldn't have as good a show without you guys. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I'll catch you next week.